In this video, we're going to take a look at some properties of limits. We'll start with just a bunch of stuff. So this is a bunch of properties of limits um, that I think will go pretty quickly for us. They're pretty straightforward. Um, we'll start with the limit of a constant function. And again, as we're talking about these, I want you to be thinking about the graphs. Now keep in mind that a graph is never an appropriate way to show work. Um, but it's helpful. For instance, this first limit is the limit of a constant function. So if I think about what a limit of a constant function is, let's say the um, line y equals 1, that's going to look like this at 1. Well, what's the limit at any point along that line? Well, it's going to approach 1 from the left and the right anywhere across that line. Okay, so it doesn't matter what x is. Um, in this case, we're saying the limit as x approaches 2 of 5. So let's just switch this to 5, if it'll let me erase. So I'm just going to move the x-axis down a little bit. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So as x approaches 2, so here's the point I'm looking at. As x approaches 2 from the left, the y value is 5, and from the right, the y value is 5. So it makes perfect sense the y value would be 5. Now, if you have something that you can use direct substitution on, then you should. So for instance, if I give you something like the limit as x approaches 1 of x, I can just plug in the value of the c value in for x. So this would, of course, be 1. So I put a little asterisk next to this because you can't always direct substitute. So in our next video, we're going to take a look at what happens when you can't direct substitute. Um, but for now, if you can direct substitute, whether it's a rational function, a polynomial function, whatever, you should. For the remaining properties, I want you to think about the fact that we're going to have basically two functions. So the first function as x approaches c has a limit of l which is f of x. The second function, g of x, has a limit of k. So these properties, the first is scalar multiple. That says if you've got some value that basically can be factored out of the function, it's okay to just sort of bring that to the front and say, let's go ahead and find the limit of f of x and then multiply it by the limit. So for instance, here, I would say, I've got a three here, so I can just take three times the limit as x approaches 4 of x squared. Well, what's the limit as x approaches 4 of x squared? Well, I can do direct substitution. 4 squared is 16, so it's 3 times 16. 3 times 16 is 48. Now you might be saying, well, that's dumb. Why don't you just direct substitute with the 3 in there? And the answer is you absolutely can. Um, you will find that our, there are some examples sometimes when it's helpful to take out that 3 or whatever that constant is. Um, but again, it's not necessary for you to do that in this case to find the correct solution. Next, sum or difference. So if you have two functions that are being added or subtracted, you can find each limit separately. So here, again, what, would I use this? No, I would use direct substitution. But essentially it's saying, you can find the limit as x approaches 2 of x squared and then subtract the limit as x approaches 2 of 3x or 3 times the limit as x approaches 2 of 2. So you get the idea. There's a lot of kind of silly um, properties that you can use that may or may not want to use. So here, limit as, of, as x approaches 2 of x squared is 4 and then 3 times the limit as x approaches 2 of x, that should be an x, would be 3 times 2, so minus 3 times 2, which is 6, so my answer is negative 2. Now, could I have found that just by plugging in the 2? Yes, I could, and that's the way I would have done it. Let me fix that to be an x. All right, let's look at the next one. We have the product. Again, this is just like sum or difference. We're saying if you've got two values that are being multiplied, you can just multiply those limits. So I can find the limit of, as x approaches 1 of 5, which is 5, 
and the limit as x approaches 1 of x cubed, which is 1 cubed or 1, and then I can multiply those together, which is the same as if I would have just done direct substitution. Same thing for quotient. If you have two values that are being divided, you can find each limit um, separately and then divide that, which makes perfect sense. So for instance, if I'm finding the limit as x approaches 4 of 2x squared, I would just do direct substitution, 2 times x squared, which would be 4 squared or 16. And then direct substitution in the denominator would give me 3 times 4. So essentially, I've got 2 times 16, or 32, divided by 12. Both of those can be divided by 4. So 8 divided by 3 is my final solution. And again, is that the exact same as direct substitution? Yes, but you'll find later that sometimes it's helpful to find those limits separately. The last one is a power. It's saying, hey, if you've got a power function, it's okay to go ahead and find the limit and then take it to that power. So for instance, in this case, instead of finding 7x to the fourth, and then plugging in the negative one, I can just find the limit as x approaches negative one of seven x, which would be negative seven, and then take that value to the fourth power. Which would be 2,401. Here's some great practice for you to do on your own, so I would like you to press pause and try all of this. Um, and when you're ready, press play to see how you did. So again, the limit as x approaches 3 of 5 is, that's just a constant, so it's always going to be 5. The limit as x approaches 3 of 5x, well, again, if I wanted to use a property, I could say that's 5 times the limit as x approaches 3 of x, or just do direct substitution, which makes more sense to me. 5 times 3 or 15. So either way you do it, you're going to get 15. The limit as x approaches 2 of 4x squared plus 3. Again, if you can direct substitute, just do it. So if you want to get crazy and say, well, this is 4. Oh, my eraser is not helping me. 4 times the limit as x approaches 2 of x squared. You sure can, but you're not going to find that I'm one that does that. And it just takes up a lot of room and it takes up a lot of time. So if I can direct substitute 2 squared plus 3, so I get 4 times 4 plus 3, that's 16 plus 3 or 19. So whether it's a polynomial or a rational, I forgot to give you a rational, um, but say I had x plus 4 over x minus 2, and the limit as x approaches 3. It doesn't matter what kind of function it is, as long as the function is defined. So this would just be 3 plus 4, and then 3 minus 2 would give me 7 over 1, or 7. So any time that you're able to do that, 3 times 2 cubed minus 2 plus 2, just do direct substitution. So limit properties are great. But don't get crazy trying to prove that you know all of the limit properties. Just do them. So, so far, these have been pretty straightforward. This is 3 times 2 to the third, or 3 times 8. And then minus 2 plus 2. Now, for this next one, again, the property would say, go ahead and take the limit as x approaches 2 of x plus 1, and then take the limit times the limit as x approaches 2 of x plus 2 and square that. So that's kind of where they're going with that limits practice. But, you know, can I just plug in 2? Yeah. So would I skip all of that? Of course I would. I'm way too lazy to do all of that work. So instead, I'm just going to direct substitute. 2 plus 1, 2 plus 2 squared. So 2 plus 1 is 3 and that's 4 squared, so 16 times 3, 48. Last one, again, it's a rational function, I'm sorry, a radical function. So I'm just, again, going to direct substitute 2 plus 4, 
just radical 6. So no special tricks or anything like that. Let's look now at limits of the composition of functions. So the way they have worded this, I think, makes it a little bit convoluted. It says that f and g are functions such that the limit as x approaches c of g of x is l, and the limit as x approaches l, so key here is that these values are the same, of f of x is f of l, then the limit as x approaches c of f of g of x is f of l. So again, I find that to be a little bit um, confusing the way that it's written. So let's take a look at an example. If I'm trying to find the limit as x approaches 2 of f of g of x, so that's that composition of functions, what I would do the long way is to say, OK, well, what is f of g of x? f of g of x would be taking f of x, so I'm going to put limit as x approaches 2, would be taking g of x and plugging that in for x in the f function. So this would be taking g of x and plugging it in for x in that function would be go ahead and compose those functions, which gives me x cubed minus 4. Well, that tells me then that I would take 2 and plug it in. So 2 cubed is 8 minus 4. So that's the square root of 4. That gives me 2. Now, what they're saying using this uh, property says if you find the limit as x approaches 2 of g of x, which in this case would be 2 cubed minus 4, which is 8 minus 4, or 4, then you can go ahead and take one of two things. You can either take the limit as x approaches 4, so notice the 4 is coming from the limit of f of x, so that tells me the square root of 4 is 2, and that's going to give you the same value that we found before. So again, Sometimes you'll find that using the composition would be more helpful, um, and sometimes you'll just use direct substitution. Lastly, a calculus course would not be complete unless we talked about trigonometric functions. Um, one thing I want to point out is the limits of all the trigonometric functions are going to be found by direct substitution with the caveat that the value of c must be in the domain of the function. So on the right, you can see I have three graphs. The first graph is sine and cosine, and those are continuous everywhere. So no matter what, I'm going to be able to find a limit for sine or cosine as x approaches anything, because they're continuous everywhere. Now, if you have tangent or secant, I've graphed both of those here, and I wanted to point out that at intervals of pi over 2 is where that function is going to be undefined. So I've put a couple of them on there for you, but remember that it's intervals of pi over 2 for tangent and secant, whereas for cotangent and cosecant, you'll notice I've got asymptotes at intervals of pi, so 0 and pi and negative pi and 2 pi and so on. So keep those in mind. And the reason I bring that up is because if I asked you then to find the limit as x approaches, uh, say, pi over 2 of tangent of x, then you would have to say that you cannot find that limit because pi over 2 for tangent, we definitely have limits that go on to infinity so d and e. But if I'm trying to find the limit as x approaches 0 of tangent, we can see that as x approaches 0, we're going to get a value of 0 because tangent of 0 is 0. And if we look at the limit as x approaches pi of x times cosine of x, again, we would say, well, this x is going to be a limit of pi. And then we would have cosine of pi. Well, what's cosine of pi? 
Again, you can certainly look on your graph or hopefully you know these by heart. So that would be pi times negative one, which would give me negative pi. The last one, limit as x approaches zero of sine squared x. Keep in mind that this is the same as the limit as x approaches zero of sine x quantity squared. So really, I'm just gonna find the limit as x approaches zero of sine. So again, you can certainly look at the graph to find the value of sine of zero. So that would be zero. And then we're going to square that, which of course gives us zero. Up next, we're going to find limits of indeterminate form functions.